All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to Chasing Waypoints podcast episode number one. So, coming to you live from the countryside, Hamul. Wish it was Baja, but maybe soon. Uh, but so, in kind of getting this started, trying to figure out what we're going to do, like what topics and what kind of things to discuss and all that. And I think the very first one that we're, we're going to tackle, and I, I thought it was a great one. It was actually a suggestion by Travis at every single Sunday. Um, it was basically, you know, super simple topic. There's not a lot of opinions on it, but it's what oil to run. What is the best oil out there for your bike? Now, me personally, I use canola mixed in with a little bit of that shine pomade kind of stuff and seems to stick pretty well to the piston walls and, and run pretty well but uh but anyway okay that's as far as i can go with a straight face on that one all right so episode number one what we are after is the f850 and the ktm 790 adventure r so at the moment i currently own both bikes um and really the difference between them and and now that I've ridden both and spent time on both and which which one would be the one uh to to do what you know what what's the impression so cover a couple of different things and as I go along I'll kind of drop in what my preference is you know I want to be as subjective as possible but at the same time the subjects I choose and the things that I do is going to be based on what my preference is and what my experience is so uh, I consider myself a uh, just right at the beginning of the intermediate level. Um, you know, I can look and read terrain, and my initial reaction isn't to let off. Sometimes it's to give it gas and, and not be as timid. Um, in the sand, uh, I feel fairly confident. Um, obviously, that could all change with one, one get-off, but I you know there's there's a different mentality that i've found with riding styles that some people love to ride sitting down some people love to ride standing up some people see things on the road and it freaks them out and others it doesn't so that's the place that i'm coming from as far as reviewing these bikes right i'm i'm i feel like i'm more like the average rider than i am the advanced rider so uh first and foremost uh the fit of the bike so uh, F850 came first, and for me, the thing with the F850 was obviously they're designed to be comfortable. I was working on BMW motorcycles at the time, so uh, it was a natural to sit on them, test ride them around the parking lot on a close course with a helmet, of course, and definitely got a feel for the bike, you know, pushing them around and, and just kind of seeing them and really getting a chance to get them up in the lift and take a look. So sitting on the bike, for me, you know, it just felt really, really good. Um, and that to me is a big selling point because adventure bikes are not meant to be loaded in the back of a truck. Adventure bikes are meant to be ridden to the trail uh, or to where you're going and, and log thousands of miles in the seat. So obviously the first impression is when you sit on the bike. You know, looks is, is part of it. Um, but truth be told, when I started working there, I looked at the 1200 GSs and I was like, oh God, who would ever ride that? And I just thought, you know, God, this thing is just so huge. But in the end and before I left, I was like, hmm, 1200 GS rally with a 21-inch front, get W to maybe see if we can do an 18-inch rear on it. You know, just completely change the bike, a 1200 GS with a boxer engine. Those things are actually really off-road capable, um, but just in a different sense. Uh, so anyway, going back to the F850, uh, when I sat on it, for me, the first thing that I noticed um, is my body composition. I am, um, you know, some people have longer legs, shorter upper body. Some have longer upper body, shorter legs. That's me. I'm a 30-inch inseam, so touching the ground wasn't too bad, and I'm not um, I'm not timid. I, I don't have to flat foot a bike to feel comfortable, like I'm okay. Um, but because I have a taller upper body once I sat on the bike... Um, the first thing I noticed is is that the handlebars felt a little bit low. So, not I mean obviously that's not a deal breaker because you know uh, rocks risers and I you know hundreds of companies make bar risers, so it wasn't that big a deal. Ultimately, what I did end up settling on was a one inch riser uh, that bolts right in. It looks OEM. I mean you can't if you look at my bike at the F850, 
you can't even tell that there's a bar riser on there until you actually look for it. It looks legit. So that's what that bike needed for me for my personal setup. If I had the lower seat on it, which I don't, um, that could have changed as well. But that to me is very important because I, I want to feel comfortable both sitting down and standing up. I don't set the bike up so that it feels perfect standing up because that's usually dangerous. Your body position is way too open uh, rather than hunched over a little bit and closed and more of that attack position. So I, I want to find that happy medium because when I ride in the dirt, I try and stand up as long as I can um, until the legs give out. And, you know, and then it's all right, we'll, we'll sit down. We're going to cruise, you know, we're just super slow because I know the importance of standing up when you're riding these bikes and especially on these big, heavy bikes. They are pretty stable, but you also want to be able to maneuver them quickly to get around rocks uh, or ruts and things like that. Because if, especially if you're going slow, uh, a 500 pound bike at zero miles an hour is 500 pounds. And it's not until you get up to that 10 and 15 mile an hour mark where the bike starts to really feel light and more nimble and all that stuff. So you got to be really careful with that, at least, at least in my opinion, um, so that, you know, again, so the comfort part of it, the handlebars, the bend was good and everything like that. Uh, ultimately, I ended up outfitting it with a set of Fast Company Flex Bars uh, on it. And that really also made a difference as far as the way the bike felt and especially worked in the off-road. It kind of added some suspension to the suspension that the bike already had. Um, so switching gears to the KTM 790, that initial impression for me of sitting on the bike uh, KTM, if you don't have a 34-inch inseam, it's uh, it's quite a bear. Uh, but, again, I'm not really timid about having to, you know, tippy-toe a bike or do that stuff. You know, you just kind of hang off one side, and it's not that big a deal. So, so as expected, it was a little bit tall, um, but I got over that really quickly. Um, the other thing that I like, but I did like right off the bat, is that the handlebars and the controls just kind of all felt like home. You can tell between the KTM and you can tell on the BMW that the BMW is a little bit more refined when it comes to the hand controls and that the way that they're set up, like the buttons look more Gucci. Wait, can I say that? Hmm. Anyway, um, it, they just look more refined as far as the KT, or as, excuse me, as far as the BMW goes. Now the KTM, obviously, they're, they're just buttons. They serve their purpose. It is what it is. They, you know, they do what they need to do. Could they be a little bit sexier, a little bit compact? Absolutely, all day long. Um, but initially, as far as the hands go and how the cockpit felt, the KTM right out of the box felt a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more like home than the BMW did, uh, than the F850GS. But the difference is, is on the KTM, you've got three positions on the upper triple clamp. Uh, where you can adjust the bars forward and back and then also the risers or the the clamps that they include with that are two-sided so you can either go a forward or a back so really you actually have six positions that you can adjust the handlebar reach with so that was really really cool we're able to dial it in and get it just right and do that stuff so obviously KTM does a little bit more on on the off-road and a lot of more research on different riders and, and the way this is where the BMW is just set up to work. Um, the KTMs, you got to do a little bit of stuff to, to get them dialed into what you want, but you have those options right off the bat. So that for me was the seating position and the feel of the cockpit, the way the thing. So riding impressions. To me, one of the biggest things is how comfortable the bike is. Uh, uh, 250 300 mile day uh road and dirt combined um that's a good day to me that that's a really like all right cool we got some miles in and so for me it really both bikes do it really well now if it's going to be a primarily road ride the bmw still has the leg up on the ktm but most everybody listening, the three of you, um, probably kind of already guessed at that, right? That the BMW was going to be more the road bike because that's what they've been building longer um, than the KTM. The KTM is not far behind. You can feel that the gearing is just slightly short, which is great in the off-road. 
um, and that it doesn't have that F850, the legs that the 850 does. Um, as you're riding both bikes at 70 miles an hour, um, the KTM is right at that point where the motor likes to eat. So you crack the throttle right at 70 miles an hour and pull it up to 80. Um, that 790 comes right to life and will just pull. The F850, you feel that linear torque all the way through. So it doesn't, there's no like step like on the KTM. The the 850, and, and to a fault, it almost seems like it makes it a little more dull even though it's got power. It's not a slouch. I'm not saying that the bike is like, oh my God, this thing is... No, it's just the power delivery is a little bit different when compared to uh, the KTM. And the KTM, you know, 790, slightly smaller motor uh, than the 850. Um, but still, both bikes, as far as power goes, you're not going to need it. And then once you hit the dirt, it doesn't matter because they all have plenty of power to do the wheel spin. Um, the electronics... On the KTM, I have the 790 Adventure R, the 2020, um, has rally mode in it. So the there's more electronic control over it, like slip control when you're in rally mode versus the BMW where it's just kind of a can tune. You can adjust the throttle profile a little bit. You can adjust the ABS a little bit. Um, you can do those things. The bikes are very similar in that sense. The throttle profiles, though, when you change through those... Um, there is a substantial difference on the KTM when you're going from road to rain to street to off-road to rally. Rally mode, that throttle is like on kill mode. If you're trying to pick your way through things, you have to be very careful. Uh, at slow speeds, you have to be really careful on or, or getting used to it that that throttle becomes really touchy. Um, it's nice when you're up on the pegs and at speed because the bike just feels like it's right there waiting for you. Anytime you come into a corner and you want to get out of it, like you just gas it and the bike is there. It's waiting. It's like looking at you like, oh, can I go? Can I go? Can I go? Come on, come on, come on. Which is really, really cool. I mean, the ride is just fantastic uh, when you get to that. But, you know, you just got to watch out on the slower stuff. The BMW, the throttle response and the throttle curves that they have depending on the ride mode are more similar like you don't really notice the difference as much but they're still there the feel is still there it's still good you know not to knock it it just i feel like now riding the two and owning the two is like the bmw is a heavier bike which will make it more stable in the dirt at speed because it just piles through things because of the weight the suspension is soft so I feel like the BMW, for the guy getting into adventure riding, the the honest with their skill set, the honest with what they want to do, the BMW, right out of the box, that package is actually really, really good with the way that it's set up. The KTM, not to say it's not, but you have more room for adjustment. It feels like you got to get used to more things, especially when it comes to off-road riding. When, when you see a bump or you see something, you're like, oh, I better back off where my previous experience with the bmw was like oh this is gonna hurt and the ktm is kind of like oh that was it so but different animals different things could i ride both of them in the same terrain for long distances and i said yeah absolutely just the ktm is gonna feel a little bit quicker because it's the suspension is better set for it so that i mean just kind of breaks it down to the basics right the feel the engine power, um, the suspension on both of them is kind of like that. Uh, it, it's difficult to say which one you're going to see, like, you know, w would I sell one today? Yeah. If I was going to sell one, it would be the BMW. Um, and not because uh, it's the BMW and I have a KTM and, you know, go orange and drinking the Kool-Aid. No, it's just I'm being more honest with the type of riding that I'm going to do. And I'm going to do a lot more dirt riding um, coming soon. You know, I, I, I'm part of the organization with Baja Rally. Um, I love doing adventure rides and setting up routes and stuff like that. And I ride to dirt. I don't ride a street ride just to ride. I, you know, I usually I'm riding somewhere where I want to do some dirt miles. 
albeit not as technical and single tracky as uh, Travis over at Single Sunday does. Um, by the way, if you ever want to see uh, a 790 doing single track, he's got a pretty cool video up on uh, on YouTube of that. So I encourage you to go over and check that out. But anyway, so that would be my choice. You know, I would keep the KTM, but because I'm being honest with myself as far as what I plan to do and what I plan to ride. And and then my skill set. And I know that, you know what, if I get faster, I know that there's people like Alex at Conflict Motorsports um, that can get that suspension finely tuned and get it back into shape, you know, fighting weight for me. Um, you know, if I smoke a wheel, um, well, actually, I'm already working on wheels anyway, but uh, talking to the guys over at W uh, to lace up a set of wheels, you know, get, you know, new hubs and everything. Um, does it need it? No, but I know better. And if I'm going to go take some rocks and really go out there, you know, you want to hedge your bets, right? You want to you want to leave with the best possible package that you can leave with and make sure that it's going to come back in shape. I've never bent a wheel. I've, I'm very precautious. I'm the last guy to air down. Um, my theory on tires is, is that if I have to air down to get better traction or better feel, I'm on the wrong tire. Um, I like to run my tires at a, at a middle of the road pressure and, and allow the tire to do the work. So if I feel like it's too skatey, then obviously I need a more aggressive tire. And then that's where um, the Adventure Mullet was born, right? Some people had, had rumored it, but I, I really started using that on, a, on the BMWs where it was running like a 50-50 dirt tire in the front. And then on the back, it was more of an all-terrain type tire. And that made a big difference, right? You know, with an all-terrain tire in the rear, you can kind of control wheel spin with your, with your wrist and traction control. But other than shifting your weight appropriately, there's really no way to get rid of a washout front or a front end that wants to keep washing out because the tire is not aggressive enough. So there's a lot of really good knobbies that are actually really good on the street, um, surprisingly so. Uh, I'm a fan of the Anarchy Wild. Um, I've logged some miles on it. And other than the noise, you can't even tell that it's a knobby tire uh, when it comes to the street, which is actually really impressive. So... Um, Bridgestone, the AX41 Adventure Cross, uh, that's another tire that's on my list to try. And I will tell you now, um, and this will probably come up, I'm sure I'll do like an episode on some tires and tire choices and what I've found. Um, but I'll tell you right now, any of the stuff that I tell you or, or, or that I say or mention on this thing, it's just my preference and I'm always trying new things. So you want to get faster, you got to try new stuff. You know, you want to get the best, you're going to have to try new stuff. You know, it's easy to just settle into a pattern and say, hey, this is my tire. But until you've tried other tires, is it really your tire? You know, um, so that really just makes a big difference uh, at the end of the day in, in getting the right package for you and getting the right motorcycle or getting the right helmet or the right gear and all that stuff. So... Anyway, this is about the 790 and the 850 GS, and honestly, between both of them, it really is going to depend on where the ride is going to, what we're going to be doing, and that kind of thing. But, you know, if I had to pick one bike to keep it, um, being honest with myself, it's going to be the 790. And it's and it really, at that point, it's only about the suspension. It really just comes down to that, just the suspension. So for a rider that's not very aggressive or just getting into the adventure bike world, the BMW is plenty. And right out of the box with the traction control, um, the different settings like Ride Modes Pro, if you get that version, um, they have cruise control depending on the version that you get, you know, the quick shift, all of that. One thing to be noted, though, about the quick shift, um, the quick shift on the 850. Uh, so when I was working at BMW, Ben, one of the techs there actually came up with something where uh, they moved the, the ball for the... Uh, for the shift actuator, moved it forward a little bit. And what it did, it actually inadvertently kind of shortened the throw of the shifter and it made it way more precise. Um, but on top of that, I don't know if the leverage changed, but the shifter felt like it was a little bit stiffer, but it was nice because it felt more positive. So on the KTM, the shift, the shift assist that they have is very I almost want to say soft it's effortless and 
you know, you think like, oh yeah, well yeah, you want it to shift like butter. True, until you downshift inadvertently because there was just almost no resistance on the thing. Um, it it is the the shift assist on the KTM is definitely more aggressive. Like if you downshift or you just push it down, you can feel the bike accelerate. Like you can hear it versus the BMW. So I don't know if they're doing it differently. Most most shift assists um, you're gonna control. You don't normally cut fueling. You cut spark. Um, so I don't know how they're necessarily each one is doing their other. And I could be wrong, and I'm sure somebody, one of the internet gurus, is going to chime in on this podcast. They'll come from their corner of the internet, work their way all the way into my inbox or slide into my DMs and be like, bro, you are totally wrong on that. It is the turbo and cabulator that makes this thing slow down. And and you know what? All right, cool. We'll, you know, But if you're going to hit me up with that, um, just like anything else, bring the information. Don't bring the opinion. If you're going to correct me on something... I want to learn about it. You know, that's just how I am. If I don't know something, I want to learn it. I want to know more about it. So if you're coming at me with opinions in the DMs uh, or sending me an email on that stuff, you know, that's great. I will dismiss it just as fast as you hit the sent button uh, if you don't include some kind of background information on it uh, or, you know, you're a reputable source. And I don't want to know about how your second aunt's third cousin's wife lives across the street from uh, Chris Parker over at uh, Rottweiler. And he actually cleans the windows on the building. And so he overheard the glass vibrating and doing some weird shit. I don't know. But, you know, it just um, obviously everybody that's going to be listening to this and eventually will know that there is a ton of opinions about things out there and how to do things and what and what oil to run and what tires to run, what air pressure to run, you know, what color underwear you should wear if you're going into the Never Never Land. You know, I mean, there's there's a ton of stuff. So at the end of the day. Um, it really just comes down to whatever works for you. So if you can ride it and you can put miles on it and you feel comfortable on it, then you're found your setup. But always be open minded and looking to you know try different things. You know that's that's going to get you set up. And then also do things that make sense as well. So um, you know don't go trying to run a slick down a sand wash because you know you see that on sand cars with the smooth front tires and thinking that's going to help you. So I definitely would not do that. But anyway, um, so yeah, so riding both, you know, this uh, actually yesterday I went um, went down to Baja really quick. It was supposed to be just a super quick trip, uh, turned into lunch with a friend, uh, a guy Mauricio from uh, Lost in Baja. And we've been friends, I think we were going on 20 years now. And, you know, we're just talking about everything going on. And, you know, we just got back from Baja um, doing some rally stuff and, and getting out there and just um, just hanging out, you know, having a good time. And so, you know, stopped in on some food. Uh, I think I put a picture up on the Chasing Waypoints Instagram. Uh, if you're not following me on Chasing Waypoints, uh, on Instagram under Chasing Waypoints, it's uh, Chasing Waypoints underscore official is the Instagram. Uh, so I'll be posting stuff to that, but uh, there's a picture of you know some of the food and stuff that uh, we had, and then I I try and post ride pictures and things of what we're doing and what's going on uh, on there. So definitely follow that if you could, that would be awesome. Um, and then so anyway, so I was on the BMW. You know, I decided you know it's just gonna be some road miles, so I figured how oh, I took that and and I stretched the KTM's legs. I did. Uh, I did about a little over a thousand miles in a week down there. Um, a lot of it rode, most of it rode, uh, but definitely did some, definitely did some dirt miles uh, for the people that kind of know Baja, doing that crossover road coming from San Felipe uh, over to the coast, um, and then went just slightly north, basically the old Baja 500 stuff, right? Cut uh, where Santa Marta is. And then cut into the coast and then came up from the south to Arendida. And the crossover road and the section going in from the highway to the coast on the KTM. The last time I did it obviously was on the F850. And I can say that the KTM felt much better through there. Um, In part, the suspension. The other part of this, uh, which is kind of cool, I think, is... The foot pegs, 
I didn't realize how much of a difference the foot pegs made on the bike. Um, but thinking about it now, um, the F850GS, I have the pivot pegs on it, um, which standard height peg, uh, except for those of you who don't know, is the peg actually will will rotate forward and back, say, 15 degrees. Uh, I mean, there's, there's an exact, you know, again, somebody's going to hit me up and go, it's 29.3 degrees. Uh, they rotate. So for some people that are more mountain bike, came from a mountain bike and are used to pedals moving and that kind of stuff, it's actually really natural. Um, it didn't really freak me out. It only freaks me out sometimes getting on the bike when you don't expect the peg to move. But I will say that when you are standing up and pivoting back and forth and coming and, and like when you get into sand and when you're, when you're accelerating... It feels really good to know when you lean and point your toes forward a little bit that you you can still feel the platform there. You don't feel like you're getting to the edge of it. When you're braking and when you're shifting, you're not getting that, that oop, I'm on the edge of the peg, I'm on the edge of the peg. You're not really getting that feeling. So those actually work really well. Um, I like them on the 850. Um, yesterday, though, when comparing them to the pegs that I have on the 790, I did feel like they're a little bit narrow, right? They don't stick out far enough from the bike to grab my whole foot all the time. I feel I can feel the very side of my foot that's going to be off a little bit. So that, you know, yesterday I noticed that more. The KTM, on the other hand, so I've been working with a company uh, called Raid Garage. Um, I purchased one of their first kits uh, for the Rally Tower uh, that they came out with and that's R A D E garage raid garage. And then also, uh, was able to get a set of foot pegs, uh, from them. Now the foot pegs that they are making are roughly, I think it's like 25% larger on them. Um, but you know, you think, Oh yeah, it's a standard wide peg, right? It's got the, the set screws in it. And that's where your traction comes from. You know, you can screw them in or take them out, whatever. Um, but the foot peg is actually lowered 15 millimeters. 15 millimeters really isn't enough for those of you on the standard system. Well, I guess all of us, right? Uh, nine sixteenths. So that's roughly about nine sixteenths of an inch. So the pegs really changed the way the 790 felt. Now, for me, I liked that change because it made the bike feel a little more stable and what I mean by that is like more stable docile you know you with the 790 like you put the bars all the way to the front and this was after riding uh, Travis from every single Sunday's 790 and man I tried not to do it because I knew what was gonna happen and ultimately ended up happening uh, which is I got one but with the bars all the way forward standard pegs you go into the corners and I mean, it's like you barely push on the handlebars and the bike just goes into the corner not falls into the corner like oh my god i'm gonna crash but more so a kind of just flows right into it with minimal effort going to the lowered pegs i noticed that it slowed that down especially when you're up on the pegs steering with steering with your legs um it just feels a little bit more stable. You're 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 putting you basically just lowered the center of gravity, 15 millimeters, um, which just out of nowhere just boom. And usually the what is I mean there's the bike and then there's the rider. So you know you're you're gonna add one of the biggest weights to the bike. So by standing up. And being 15 millimeters lower, it really changes the center of gravity and the way that the bike felt. I absolutely loved them. In the corners, which I'm really timid, especially in the dirt corners, the bike just leaned better and I felt like it was 100% there for me, which is really crazy. And I'm on Dunlop Dur or Duramax, Trail Maxes, uh, which is also another really, really good tire, especially on the street. And then in the dirt, it's like, this is a, still a dirt tire even though the rear still looks like the adventure mullet setup set up where you're like, oh, there's no way that has traction in the dirt. You can run the KTM on rally mode with slip set to three. And if you need to spin the tire, you can spin it. If you need the traction, the bike catches right up with you uh, and lets the thing go. So 
the bike can become really hard to hold on to with that tire, which is amazing. You know, a lot of people, when you look at the tire, you wouldn't think that that rear tire would develop that much traction, but it does. Anyway, so the foot pegs really, really made a difference. And in the end of it, it was like, well, it's just one more thing that we're putting towards making the bike feel like home. Um, anytime I get a bike, that's really everything that I've done. I mean, I've had several money pits. Um, I had a DRZ 400. I'll, I'll dig up a picture and put it up on uh, on the Instagram. Um, I've had the F800 GSA, the GS Adventure. Then I went to the F850 uh, GS, which I have now and now, obviously, the KTM. And then in between there, I had an XR600 for like 30 minutes. And then... Uh, what other FZ07? So I've had a few different bikes, not not as many as uh, some people will uh, over the course of the years, but I've had a few different bikes, and each bike has been unique. And each bike I've worked on making it look aesthetically pleasing to me, and then also put things on it that work, and in my opinion, work the best for the type of riding that I'm going to be doing, and then also for the stuff that I like to do um, and, and how I like a bike to feel. You know, uh, years back, we we built a race car here in, in San Diego uh, with a with a outfit, uh, Jimco Racing. They've built, you know, like, three cars for Baja. Just kidding. Uh, it's like, I, they had to have built a 1,000 cars by now for Baja. I mean, it's just crazy. And the craftsmanship and everything. But when we were building our car, uh, at one point, Mike Jolson, the then owner, invited us in and said, hey, we need you guys to come in and sit in this thing. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So we went in and sat in it. And, you know, as we're sitting there and, you know, my dad gets in, then I get in and we're looking at it. And I think my brother was there too, Adrian. And it was like, okay, how's the reach right there? All right, how does that feel? Okay. How's this? All right, where's that? And the, he said, he's all, when you get into these cars, it has to feel like the office. Everything is right where it needs to be. Nothing is further. Nothing is closer. Nothing is further out of reach. Nothing is near. Nothing is kind of eh. Everything is exactly where it needs to be. And that always stuck with me, right? The switches. I, you know, I didn't like how the switches on the DRZ look, the kill switch and the start stop switch or wait that's one of the same kill switch and the starter button so highway dirt bikes got one of their setups rewired the thing it looked way better aesthetically the switch was sealed so i knew it wasn't going to give me issues and it just worked and everything was right where it needed to be so that that's always been my mentality is is just chase down the things that make it make the bike for you and okay yeah eventually you're gonna sell it well i've got news for you is one i don't care how smoking of a deal you got on all of those parts to put on your bike it's it's the same thing as usual people are going to look at it they're going to compare it to what the other bikes are going for that are bone stock and they're going to want to give you bone stock retail uh on it or trade in or whatever whatever you want to call it but they're not going to want to pay for all of those accessories they're going to want to try and get those accessories for free so that's why in my garage, in a box, I've got the complete headlight assembly for the 790. Because when it comes time to sell it, I know that somebody is not going to want to pay money for that tower. They're going to want it, but they're not going to want to pay money. So case in point, I've got tires and wheels uh, that from it that I'm looking, I'm talking to W about and building a set of wheels for the bike and trying to sell those. And everybody wants... They want a second set of wheels, and rightfully, because this is how my mentality would be, is that you could just throw on the bike ready to go. Spacers are there, sprockets there, rotors are ready, and all that stuff. Except, they want to pay, like, they want to pay, like, what the rim would cost just on its own. You know, you're talking, like, say, I've gotten a couple offers for a grand. For full turnkey set of wheels. Tires, rotors, and all that Rotors are like three hundred dollars a pop, or two some I don't know, and then you know sprocket whatever that's a giveaway. But just the rotors, just three rotors, and it's like wait, but you only want to. How does this make sense? You want to pay this much 
for all of this stuff. And it's only 2,000 miles old. It's not like I'm selling stuff that's clapped out, beat up, and, you know, the rotor's on its last 30 seconds. No. This is stuff that's still got life on it. I mean, it's only got 2,000 miles. You're welcome. I broke it in for you. You know, the bearings are good. Everything's good. I mean, I have washed the bike once with it, and I know better than to hit areas like the bearings and the hubs with high pressure water and all that stuff you just want to wipe it down and let the grease or whatever the crap fall off of it but anyway it's just it's it's been funny and anytime you try and sell anything it's always the same thing you're going to get a lot of guys that are low ballers a lot of guys that happen to work for galfer and ktm is their last name and you know they know better about what pricing and you're not going to fool me and you know you got that and then you got the guy from northwest south austria that says you know his uncle died and left him half of ktm and you know he's got about a thousand dollars he can give you in exchange for the wheels but you'll be rewarded in the future and all this other shit so i don't know at the end of the day it's like all right well i know what i need to get the reason i want wheels is because i know where rocks hide and the wider the rim is, the closer it is to the rocks. So narrower rims usually protect it better. The sidewall on the tires bulge a little bit differently. You get better cornering traction, especially when you lay the bike down because now the tires got a slightly rounder profile. There's a lot of plus sides to this. So that's definitely the way that I want to kind of go with that. But I don't know. It's all fun. Uh, I think the biggest thing and the moral of the story on this episode that is supposed to be about uh, the F850 versus the 790 um, it really is going to boil down to what kind of riding you're going to do and being honest with yourself if you're, if you're listening to this and you're thinking you know one it means I did the SEO right and, and you were able to find this on the depths of the internet but you're listening to it because you're considering different bikes and maybe these are the two that you are considering. And let me tell you, they're two different animals. I used to think when I first got them and when I was talking to Travis about it, it was like, I think they're going to be pretty similar. And then once I had them both and started riding them both, uh, no, they're not. So sit on both of them and really feel it out. But more so and more importantly is be really honest with yourself. What you plan on doing and how you plan on riding the bike because... If you're not honest with yourself on that, you get the wrong bike, you're not going to like it. And you're going to start chasing stuff to make it more comfortable, and you're going to start doing all of these things to try and get it better for the stuff that you want to do. And it's not, it, it's even, it turns into an even bigger money pit, right? You know, in both, you put skid plates on the BMWs, you usually do crash guards, you know, crash bars. You know, you could do lights on both. You can do all of this stuff. So save your money for that rather than than spending a bunch of money on, well, you know, I I like the I like the FA50, but man, I, I you know, a year from now, um, I'm going to be teaching Quinn Cody how to ride. Right? That's your, you know, that's kind of your thing. Like, oh, I'm going to be this big off-roader and all that stuff. Yeah. But then you realize when you got to ride the bike 300 miles to the road, or you decide to do a cross country trip, which is mostly road miles. Well, I'm gonna go put this like, you know, Honda Goldwing seat on my KTM 790 because the seat sucks. Well, the seat actually doesn't suck. I have the power parts lowered seat on it. Between that and the pegs, the bike is like home. I mean, it feels so good. But it's because my range is two to three hundred miles with dirt in between, which means I'm standing up more. Versus some guys where it's like, ah, no, yeah, man, I'm going to do about, you know, 600 miles today, all road. Well, by the time you get there, your ass is going to be sore and you may not have a line. So you have to really be honest with yourself when it comes to that if you're going to pick it. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to get both bikes and, and ride both bikes and spend time on both bikes. Um, the one that I still have a kind of like a, hmm, I want to is the the Tenere 700 right it only took like 16 years for them to come out with it um you know they kept dropping hints that it was coming that it was coming and then i get the ktm and then boom t700 so that's another bike that i want to ride and just kind of see and feel out um you know what it's like and that way you know and why because i want to know because it's a it's an experiment and ex experimentation you know, if I sit on that bike and I go, man, the seat height's like here and then the handlebars here feel here. 
hmm, I wonder if I put like a 10 millimeter bar riser on the KTM, that might actually feel better. And now I go back to the bike I do own, and then I have an idea. You don't know what feels good. You don't know what's going to be the absolute best setup until you sit on it or until you try something. So you might as well just keep trying stuff, know where you're coming from, know where you're going to, and know how to get back. So if you're ever interested in doing suspension work and the suspension stuff, you want to get lost, try messing with clickers with 55 clicks in it. Good luck trying to find yourself back if you don't know where you started. So anyway, uh, we're going on 40 minutes. Uh, I think this is pretty good for the first episode. Um, So I will end it on KTM 790 Adventure 2020 versus the F850 GS. That is the non-adventure version. Um, 2019, I believe. So which one is better? Don't know. Where are you going? I think really that's the ultimate choice. If you're looking at both of those bikes... Uh, my opinion is is that if I was going to do mostly street and going to run that thing down down the highway, you know, hit very little dirt, then, yeah, BMW it is. Uh, but if I know that I'm going to want to ride, I'm going to look for every dirt road that I can, or I know that I'm going to be hitting some pretty rough, you know, terrain when I do get on the dirt, and I want to feel better and more comfortable and, and know that the bike is there for me, then, yeah, uh, it's, it's going to be the KTM, hands down. So that's that's my, that's how I see it. So I will close this up with saying thank you very much for hanging out with me for almost 42 minutes now. Uh, you have the choice to subscribe to the podcast. It would be greatly appreciated. Um, there is Chasing Waypoints underscore official on Instagram. You look up Chasing Waypoints on Uh, YouTube, you'll find me there, and Facebook as well. So feel free to subscribe to those, like those. You'll be having more content, more videos. Uh, Next episode, so that's going to be episode number two, uh, we're going to pick some stuff and talk more about some of the rides uh, coming up and some of the stuff going on uh, and planning routes and stuff like that. And so if you're looking at getting into route planning and working on GPS files and things like that, I've got a video already up on YouTube. Uh, showing you how to use Google My Maps and converting that to a GPX and then getting it to your GPS or uh, your Trail Tech Voyager Pro or whatever it is. GPX is a pretty universal file. So anyway, so there's information there already. If you guys want to head over to that, feel free to subscribe, please. Uh, Again, subscribe to the podcast, and we will see you guys on the next episode.